So today I'm finishing up a series that we started back in January on the living kingdom. And so we've been through the five discourses of the Gospel of Matthew. And I did a little calculation this week. It, it was probably about 14 to 15 hours of speaking. So today's a wrap up. So how do you wrap up 14 or 15 hours of teaching on the living kingdom? Uh, well, you do it briefly, otherwise everybody's going to be leaving. So I just want to ask the Lord to give me ability this day because I've got something to prepare to give to you as a wrap-up from this. Because uh, living kingdom, it is alive. The kingdom of God is alive because our God is alive. And living kingdom is what his people do. They live with this king here. Now, this place. So, Father, I just ask in, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son sent for us, that you would give me ability this day to speak well of you. Holy Spirit, you are the master teacher. Bring to bear these lessons on those who are here. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I begin with the last verse of the book of Acts. This is what it says, the last two verses. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Now look at this. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Now wait a minute. He was under arrest. And Paul was the traveler. He was always on the move. But not in these years. Rented house, two years, people came to him. But what did he do? He proclaimed the kingdom of God. And he proclaimed the Lord Jesus Christ with boldness. And then it says without hindrance? Well, isn't being kept captive, isn't that kind of a hindrance? Not really. God uses anybody who's available and makes themselves available. A couple weeks ago, there was a men's breakfast here, and you get follow-up stories from the breakfast a little bit, and one of the men that comes to the Wednesday night or the Wednesday morning Bible study talked about sitting at a table with uh, some, some older men and then some younger men, and these younger men were, are part of the Washburn High School, and I guess I'm getting this secondhand, so... The details don't matter because the point does. So they're talking about the game, and I guess Washburn hacked up a furball. They just didn't do very well in the football field. And uh, so then you get, when your team doesn't do really good, what's, what's the thing that you tend to do? Try to break it down and figure out what's wrong. Well, the problem is, is the people that were breaking it down and doing something weren't part of the team. And the one man said, well, if you want to do something about it, join the team. Ah, now there's something. So if you want to do something in the kingdom of God, join it. If you're part of the kingdom of God, keep working. Be part of it. What are you waiting for? Kingdoms are always in conflict. If you haven't figured that out, you haven't been watching the news. Now, we usually don't call them kingdoms anymore. We call them nation states and stuff like that. But there's this conflict, but there's this big, big conflict going on right now between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. This is the big conflict that's going on. Kingdoms are always in conflict. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 um, is an amazing place to start when it comes to understanding these two kingdoms. Then God said, let us make man in our image and like, our likeness, that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. This is a huge conflict right now between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. 
This is one of the touchstone places that this conflict is really being seen and played out right now. See, when we say God is God, we say that he's the creator God. God is the source. That's what the Bible proclaims. He is the source. This week again, found out that scientists have created a mouse embryo without an egg and without sperm. That's weird. But see, this is the thing that man has, but man still had to start with something. God started with, this is what the Bible says, God started with nothing. And he created. So the source is God, out of nothing. He has no needs. It's been done out of love. It's been done out of goodness. It's been done out of his glory. We are created. Mankind has been created. This is what we hold on to as we proclaim the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. We start with creation and the creator God. Humanity has an idea of independence. Mankind thinks they are, he's independent. Because what he and what's been spoken for many years in different, different ways is that all that we see and all that has happened and all that we look out on came from chaos. And it just happened to fall together. And this is really strong. This is the premise of many people's thinking. It just happened. And so I just happened. There's no actual reason to be. It just happened, and now we have to make something of it. That's kind of the thinking. We just happen to be, now we've got to do something with it. Arthur Allen Leff writes it this way, I want to believe, and so do you, in a complete, transcendent, and imminent set of propositions about right and wrong. In other words, transcendent being beyond us, imminent being within us. Findable rules that authoritatively and unambiguously direct us how to live righteously. I also want to believe, and so do you, in no such thing. But rather that we are wholly free, not only to choose for ourselves what we ought to do, but to decide for ourselves individually and as a species what we ought to be. We want, and then he does this as amazes me, what we want, heaven help us, because he's not, he's not a believer. But here he does, he invokes the idea of heaven, God. What we want, heaven help us, is simultaneously to be perfectly ruled and perfectly free. That is, at the same time, to discover the right and the good and to create it. See, this is humanity. Humanity wants to find out the rules, but it also wants to make up the rules. It wants good. It wants righteousness. Um, sometimes, brothers and sisters, when you listen to the news and you're listening to all the stuff that's going on, we become prejudiced right away in the way we think. But if you think about it, many people are looking for righteousness. They are looking for justice. It's a big word these days. I believe it's because creator God put it in us. Justice isn't something you just discover and it, you make it up. It's been given. See, this is the way I would see it. God created, here's, how the, here's, the, here's the two kingdoms. God created or human creation. Those are the two kingdoms. This is what I'm watching going on in the Western world especially. You and I here sitting at Grace Bible Fellowship, we go to the top and go, God created it. But we're living with a lot of people around us say, no, it's just human creation. It's what we make of it. These kingdoms are in conflict. And this, is, this, causes, this causes tension. <laughs> if God shows up, there's tension. Because <laughs> God is God, and I am not, and no are you. Kingdoms are in conflict. There's something wrong. What's wrong? Well, if we go by the, what we talk about the created world, 
corruption, just like that fox down the road. Oh, he's so cute. But he's not going to stay cute very long. Four and a half year old got it figured out. Corruption. Deterioration. Created good, went bad. Our created ancestor, Adam, used his freedom to self-identify as God. And I'm using, I'm using modern language there. You know I am. Um, self-identifying is, is a big deal today. Self-imaginary, one man calls it. Well, Isaiah 53, 6 says this. If we go back to our kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of righteousness, we're all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So it combines something here. But that first line is we want to self-identify. We're going to be our own God. We're going to be our own Savior. We're going to be on our own. Each his own way. But there's something that happens here. We come up short in the right and wrong category. How many of you came up short in the right and wrong category in the last month? All right, you're being honest, right? So me too. Oh, how many days I wish I could just do it all right, everything right. And then it doesn't take but about two minutes out of my bed, and it's like, oh, shoot, here goes another day. All I'm trying to point out is that we seek this, we desire it, we look for it. So does mankind. But mankind uses a different method to get there. Here's what God says. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, we read this about this corruption. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live and you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So these kingdoms in conflict, God says when you live in human kingdom, you're dead. You're dead because you're apart from me. I'm your creator. Acknowledge me. James 3, 8, and 9 says it this way. But no human being can tame the tongue. How'd you do this week? Anybody use my message from last week, called somebody a moron down at the, at the traffic circle? Moros, fool. That's the Bible word, the New Testament word. No human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 again. See, God made man to rule the earth, king of the earth, you could almost say. And I, I say that, king of the earth, because that's what it was meant for. But corruption came in because our ancestor, Adam, decided he had a better plan. And this corruption, as we know from our, from our understanding of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, of God the Father, this corruption has a name. It's called sin. Again, there's some words that we in, as uh, followers of Jesus use very, very easily. They, they just roll off us, and they should roll off us. Uh, I, somebody told me today, they just, they, as long as they don't use the word Jesus with their family, she's okay. But if she invokes the name of Jesus, they're all over her. But we use the name of Jesus. We proclaim his name. We also say the word sin. If you don't think that word has power, still has power, use it sometimes with men's kingdoms. Men's kingdoms do not like to talk about sin. They talk about shortcomings, policies, laws, things that will come into play to do something. But see, sin is two things. It is action and it is a disposition. If you think of sin as an action, it's only the deeds that you do. Uh, it's the, the lie you said, you know. It's the, it's the breaking of a law that you knew was you shouldn't do. You know, you're, you live really close to Lake Superior and you still dump your, your wastewater in the lake. You're breaking the law. 
but it's my property. Still the law. Sometimes we think in terms of action only, but the scriptures and the kingdom of God tells us that sin isn't just an action, it's a disposition. It's something that kind of just comes to us naturally to fall away from him. And sin brings two consequences then. Sin brings slavery and it brings judgment. In the words of Robert Thune, I'll just read it. Sin brings two drastic consequences into our lives. First, sin enslaves us. When we turn from God, we turn to other things to find our life, our identity, our meaning, and our happiness. So I, I went to the Big Top Chautauqua last night to, have a con- to go to a concert. It was invited. It was wonderful. And I'm, I'm enjoying the, the whole setting or whatever, and, and especially John and Pam's celebrating their 40th wedding anniversary. And I'm listening to The, the Temptations, a music group from Motown. Been around 60 years. Their, their lead singer, 81 years old next month. Still got it. Still singing. But what I also watched around me was people identifying with this music. They were all a bunch of old codgers up there last night. <laughs> Listen to the music of their youth. That's what I started to see. And so they're trying to pull in something that gives them meaning. Now, I can't, I can't make that judgment all the way across the board. But we all try to find things that give us identity, meaning, and purpose. But when we do it apart from God, these things become substitute gods, which the Bible calls idols. They soon enslave us, demanding our time, our energy, our loyalty, our money, everything we are and have. They begin to rule over our lives and hearts. This is why the Bible describes sin as being the masters of us. Sin causes us to serve created things rather than the creator. Second, sin brings condemnation. We're not just enslaved by our sin, we're guilty because of it. We stand condemned before the judge of heaven and earth. The wages of sin is death. We are under the death sentence for our cosmic treason against the holiness and justice of God. His righteousness, anger towards sin, stands over us. Yet we're in this conflict with another kingdom. As I say those things, as the Bible proclaims those things, there's a conflict going on. The kingdom of God against the kingdom of mankind. The kingdom of mankind basically says this, that we're conditioned by our environment alone. Just how I've been raised and the place I'm at and the time I'm in, that is really just what made me. I am nothing more than just the result of where I live and who I live with. It's a recognition that the planet is, is raw material just needing to be conquered. Which again, in some ways, God gave the earth to man, Adam and Eve, to rule. In some ways, to go forth from the garden and, and, and create it. Not create it as out of nothing, but to make something of it. The human to human contact in this man kind of world is pliable, it's not set. No rules except those imposed by other humans. That's why kingdoms are in conflict in this world. What's Russia trying to do to Ukraine right now? Impose its will upon it. What's Ukraine doing back? We don't want your will. And all around our world, this is going on. But this is because mankind thinks that he can make his own rules and come up with them. And as long as I have more power than you do, I can impose my rules. This is something the United States has been guilty of in the world politic. We're the big guy. Talk to some of the little guys sometimes. Talk to citizens of some of the little guys in the world. Yes, there's many people that want to get here. That's why Texas and all those places people are crossing because there's something better here than where they're at. But we're the big boss. But what does everybody try to do to the king of the hill? Take them down. See, this kind of stuff is going all around us. 
Man will save man. This is the kingdom of man. Man will save man until he can't. It's okay to do whatever you can. All you can do really is control the chaos a little bit. That's all you can do. That's the, that's the kingdom of mankind, apart from the creator God. See, these kingdoms are in conflict, and we are living out our lives among this conflict of these king, this kingdom, this, these two major kingdoms fighting for supremacy. Early in the series, I made uh, these three basically starting points when we were studying the living kingdom. Kingdom is God's reign. He is, he is absolutely sovereign, Lord, master, despot, dictator. I, you, know, you don't want to use the word dictator with God, but you get the idea. What he says goes. The limits he puts on are him. You can't go beyond him. You can push against him. But God reigns. The second thing we looked at a little bit was kingdom is about saving rescue. So our God loves his creation. Even its rebellious people, he, he, he loves them. And mankind needs a savior. It needs a true king. And so that's why, again, Acts 28, 31, we read this again, that Paul, in his captivity was able to say, I preach Christ. And he proclaimed the gospel. He proclaimed the kingdom of God. This is what he was doing because God had sent a rescue and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, he reigns. Jesus, Savior. Christ, Messiah, coming one. And the amazing thing is that he's truly human, this king of ours, truly human, uniquely human. He is the God-man. And there is only one God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the creator becoming a man whom he created. This is Christ. This is Jesus the creator becoming man whom he created. This is so important for us, brothers and sisters, as we recognize the conflict that we're in. Who is he? Well, there's a lot of ways you can go this way, but you ask the reporters questions. Who is this? Well, he's a substitute. Jesus Christ is a substitute. The perfect for the imperfect, the guiltless for the guilty, He's a place taker. That's what he is. Who is he? He's the king. He's the substitute. What is he? He's the place taker, this substitute. Where? Where? Jerusalem. AD 30. History. Set in time, set in place. When? About A.D. 30. How? How is he this way? Because of an execution on a wooden cross. Why? Because of the love of the creator for his principal creation. Man is God's principal creation. And so Jesus became a man and died as a man as a substitute, as a place taker for God's principal creation. Yet, mankind, as we speak, says, I want nothing to do with God. Ah, uh, we will be our own God. We will colonize Mars. We will colonize Jupiter. We will go beyond. We will freeze people for 400 years and then awaken them somewhere. This is the way man thinks. This is the way mankind thinks. Because mankind says this. All there is is stuff, and behind stuff, there is nothing. 
All there is is stuff. And behind stuff, there is nothing. So, carpe diem. How many of you have heard that phrase? Carpe diem. Oh, got to know some Latin, right? It's cool to know Latin. Seize the day. There's some good in that, but not like mankind preaches. Mankind preaches seize the day because there's nothing else to do, because there's nothing behind anything that we do when it's all done. So, seize the day. I am what I make of myself. Self is all that I have. I will be what I say I am. Are you hearing this today? I will be what I say I am. It is everywhere right now. And into this conflict, brothers and sisters, we enter in and say, no. You have been created. I have been created. We are not self-creation. So in the kingdom of mankind, from chaos can only come one thing, really. Chaos. And corruption. Those of you that have done enough history, now those of you that have studied enough history, how long does a kingdom of man really last? How big was the United Kingdom a hundred years ago? And now it just keeps shrinking and shrinking. How long can the United States of America stay on top of the heap? Because that's the path. It's just the path. If and only if you hold on to a kingdom of mankind. Because kingdoms run on power. Um, mankind today says, we are our own savior. And what I, again, find fascinating is that, um, and people have accused me of being a tree hugger, you know, because sometimes I talk about, you know, that we mess with the environment and stuff like that. And sometimes they think, you know, I'm, you know, global warming, you know, I'll, I, I, I think there's something to it because I think we've been crapping in our own kennel. but I can't push it too far. I know that. But kingdoms run on power. And every savior has to have some kind of power behind it. And mankind's saviorness is not an energizer battery. It's running dry. But God will not. God will never run out of power to save. See, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 26 talks about power, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, resurrection of dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits. then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. See, we need to understand this, that death is the enemy. Does the, does the world, does mankind understand that? There was some moaning and groaning again in the news because the life expectancy in the United States dropped by one year over the last year again. So it used to be, what, 72? Now we're down to 70. And see, these are the measures that man uses. Death is always a measurement. What do the Ukrainians want to do to the Russians right now? If you want to put it as simple as possible, kill them. What are the Russians want to do to the Ukrainians right now? Kill them. See, this is mankind's power. God's power is to make the dead alive. 
Both kingdoms recognize the power of death, but only one has the power to reverse it. Acts 26, 8. Paul standing trial before Festus, the king back then in that, in that setting. And here's what Paul said in the midst of his defense to Festus. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? Amen. Mankind has the power to kill, but he cannot raise to life again. Now, scientists are working on it. They are. And they may try some things. And what they might be able to create won't be what God created. My personal feeling is if man ever was able to do this, it wouldn't be a human spirit inhabiting whatever they created. It would be a demon inhabiting them. Now, maybe I'm getting too science fiction-y there, huh? But the fact is, is that only God has the power to raise from the dead. Why should we think this incredible? Why should we think it's incredible that God created everything? Why? Why should we think that's incredible? Why don't we instead go, that's the life for me. I'll walk with this God. The human kingdom can only delay death. It can only keep it away for so long. You talk to, uh, you talk to hospital administrators, most of the money's much great great amount of money is spent towards the end of people's lives. Hundreds of thousands of dollars to gain a few more minutes, a few more hours, a few more days, maybe a few more years. But they can only delay it for so long. And how many of you have ever had surgery with general anesthesia? When you have surgery with general anesthesia, what do you remember? I've tried four times, I think. Nothing. You know what was so amazing when you think about it? What was I doing with the people cutting me open? I was trusting them. I was absolutely trusting them. And so this is what we do with a God. We do too. This is, this is faith. We trust God. We lay ourselves before him. Let him do his work in us. How many of you used, uh, gotten a taxi cab? Or, oh, here's the better one. How many of you used GPS to get where you, you got to get going? You actually trust that thing? Sure you do. Yeah, you can shake your head like, no, I don't, but why do you still use it then? Because you want to say to it, well, you were close. Again, I'm coming back to this idea that there's these two kingdoms in conflict. And they both work on trust. They both work, work on trust. But they both have to work on power as well. And mankind does not have the power of God. God has given lots of ability to mankind. God has given much ability to mankind. Just think about it. 1922, how many things have happened in 100 years as far as medical technology? There's some of you sitting out here, I know, have artificial valves in your heart right now. Some of you, I know, got pumps in you, keeping the pain away. But man only can go so far. But God, being rich in mercy, with the love that he loved us, has sent his son for us. And this is, this is the defining thing between the two kingdoms. The defining issue between the two kingdoms is who is Jesus Christ? Is he just a historical figure who has had some influence in people's lives and they do things in, you know, in his name or whatever? Or is he king of kings and lord of lords? So why wrap up this way out of a uh, basically six months of uh, 
living kingdom. Because the last part of the last three emphasis in this whole series was the kingdom of God is also living and dynamic. It is present. It is alive. And we can be alive to it. So I, brothers and sisters, I bring this to you, mostly Grace Bible Fellowship, visiting here today, thankful for you to visit. You're going to head home somewhere. You're probably camping or, um, that's great, we're glad you're here. But I'm the pastor and shepherd of this church, so I've got a question for you. And I'm going to use an old prophet's question. Elijah, Second King, or 1 Kings 18, 21, we read this. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? And I would put in their kingdoms. How long will you waver between two kingdoms? Which one are you listening to? Which one are you living for? If the Lord is God, follow him. If mankind is God, follow them. This was indictment. The people said nothing. Brothers and sisters, it's not time to say nothing. If you're complaining about the world that you live in and all the stuff that's going on around you, if you're full of complaint and gripe and moaning and stuff, get in the game. Get in the kingdom. Be an instrument to his use. Because certainly our God can save and save to the uttermost. And we can be like Paul, who didn't even count his own life. Give it up. Use me, Lord. So again, I'll close with uh, some words from Robert Thune. When we trust in Jesus, we are released from sin's condemnation and from its bondage. And there are a lot of people, that's the, the kingdom of mankind can only give a limited sense of freedom. It cannot release people from bondage, darkness within. We are free to say no to sin and yes to God. We are free to die to ourselves and live for Christ and his purposes. We are free to work for justice in the world. We are free to stop living for our own glory and start living for the glory of God. We are free to love God and others in the way we live. God has promised that Jesus will return to finally judge sin and make all things new. Until then, he's gathering to himself a people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people. As a part of that called and sent people, we have the privilege of joining him in the mission. As individuals and as part of his spiritual family, by grace we can enjoy God, live life for his glory, serve humanity, make his gospel known to others through our words and actions. This is the good news. This is the true story. This is the gospel. This is the kingdom. Now, this is, this is, this is one of those things where we all do self-evaluation. And I don't want, you know, it's really easy to come down hard because I can stand up here and do this to you guys. But believe me, I stand in the same place you all do. Where's, who has my heart? Who has your heart? Which kingdom are you serving? Are you afraid of the kingdom of mankind? There's no need to be. Because our God is king. And he will use any one of us in all the ways that we can serve him. We don't all, have to, we don't all serve him in the same skills. That's what the Bible tells us. But we can serve him all with the same heart. So how long will you vacillate between two opinions? That's the question. Don't do what they did and say nothing. So Lord, I have gathered before these people this day. I have desired and I, I stand with them. If I was here, I, I, I am standing here, but I, I'd be down there. Uh, another man could be doing what I'm doing right now. And I would have to stand with the same way. Lord, may you have mercy on us that we may flow into your grace and mercy. That we will keep your kingdom before us. Live out our lives with purpose and meaning. Not by our own power. Because you are the power. To you belongs the glory. 
So, Lord, move in Grace Bible Fellowship as we enter this phase, this next phase this year, as we come into our school year. And, but, Lord, we, we don't want to just repeat things over and over because we've done them that way before. Some things we want to repeat over and over because that's the truth. But, Lord, I pray that we'll get in the game because otherwise, what are we waiting for? Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.